Hello and um, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope it is all right if we start more or less on time. Um, it's wonderful to see you all and thank you for taking the time and joining the Oxford Interfaith Forum tonight. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce a wonderful colleague to you, um, Yasmin Gokpinar, Dr. Yasmin Gokpinar. She actually works for two institutions. One is the University of Bochum, where she works at the Institute for Oriental and Arabic or Islamic Studies. But she is also a fellow of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And there she is involved in a most um, interesting project um, about um, the ancient music beyond Hellenization, which focuses on the uh, relationships between the musics of the Hellenistic world and the ancient Near East. So this is truly a fascinating world she's exploring there. But she is also a musician herself, playing the saxophone um, and other instruments and practicing them, which is, which is wonderful. And she is also very well versed in Arabic poetry, uh, literature of exiles and manuscript studies. So as you can see, a woman of many, many talents. And I first heard about her when um, in the context of the study of female singing and the singing of female slaves um, in the Islamic states of the medieval period. So I guess this is a truly, truly fascinating subject. Uh, subject she's also going to introduce us today, at least fleetingly. And then we hope to welcome her back, um, maybe in January next year, where she is going to present this topic of women singing and women um, making music in the Islamic world and uh, I'm looking forward very very much indeed to your lecture today Yasmin and then hopefully we're going to see you in January again. So the floor is yours everyone please mute yourselves um, for the next 40 minutes and then you're welcome to join us for the Q&A. So thank you very much for your kind introduction. I hope the presentation is going on now. I'm pleased to present you today what the Arabs call, uh, like to call the second teacher, namely after Aristotle. And this is Al-Farabi as the author of the Kitab al-Musiqi al-Kabir, the great book on music. Uh, before I talk about Greek music theory and Muslim thought, I would like to thank Diana Matud and Thea Gomelauri for the kind invitation to the Oxford Interfaith Forum. Uh, for contextualization, I uh, will first discuss the early history of music in the Islamic world, also looking at cultural contexts other than Greek, then locate the science of music in the history of Greco-Arabic sciences, and finally come to Al-Farabi's book on music, which I will present as an example of the transfer of science. Particular attention will be paid here to the formation of a musical language and the transfer of concepts. Finally, we will have a look at the musical developments after Al-Farabi, but this will only be very short, I think. The music of the Islamic world emerged in confrontation and interaction with various cultures, languages, and regions, especially the great empires of the Byzantines in the Northwest and the Sassanids in the Northeast, as well as their respective vassal states, the Rassanids and the Lakhmids. It developed as part of cultural transformations in the course of cultural transfers, exchange processes and acculturations through the expansion of the Islamic empire. The vassal states served as buffer zones between the two great empires of the Byzantines and the Persians. As you can see from this map, the Arabian Peninsula was crisscrossed with trade routes, the most famous of which are the incense routes and the pre-Islamic pilgrimage route to Mecca and the trade route to Okaz with its famous market. Thus, the roots of Arabic musical culture also lie in pre-Islamic times, 
Especially the Huda, the song of the camel drivers, is often mentioned here, but laments and joyful singing, um, just as children's songs, lullabies, or songs on wedding celebrations were also part of the repertoire of the time. Jewish and Christian settlements in Yathrib, the old Medina, and Najran, on the other hand, the border areas with the Byzantine and Sassanid empires in the north, on the other, and the trade routes through the Arabian Peninsula probably played a role in the development of, Arabic, uh, of Arab music at an early stage. This period of Jahiliya, the so-called time of ignorance before Islam, also saw the emergence of the ancient Arabic Qasida, an elaborate genre of poetry that takes the mourning for the beloved at abandoned tent sites as the starting point of a journey through the desert. Finally, at the end of this journey is the tribal praise or mockery of another tribe. The center of poetry um, competitions was the aforementioned market in Rukhaz, which took place once a year during the holy months and was well attended because of its proximity to the pilgrimage site of Mecca and the incense route. The protagonists of this ancient and glorious poetry, which was recited aloud, perhaps sung, were mostly men, but poems by women have also survived, such as the following by the famous Khansa, who mourns her brother killed in the battle. Even Al-Jarir, himself a famous poet, admitted the poetic greatness of this poetess. Female singer-slaves, Qiyan or Jawari, described not as poets but as professional musicians, are also mentioned in pre-Islamic times. Muawiyah ibn Bakr al-Amlaqi is said to have possessed two female singers in Yathrib. Uh, at that time, two types of Qiyan crystallized, the more prestigious ones, namely those of the noble Arabs, whether Bedouins or townspeople, and those of the taverns and wine merchants, who offered their services as prostitutes in addition to singing. We know from literature that in addition to female singer-slaves, there were also free female singers as early as the Jahiliya, and later in Islamic times. At the beginning of the Abbasid period, there were princes as well as princesses who devoted themselves to music. However, the restrictions imposed on women since that time drastically reduced the number of free singers, at least banishing them behind the walls of the harem. Singing schools flourished first in Medina and later in Mecca, attracting male uh, singers as well. These, unlike the female singers, were free but were usually under the protection of a tribe or noble as Mawali ward. The hapless Abbasid Caliph Ibrahim ibn al-Mahdi, who reigned only for one year from 817 to 19, is the well-known exception. He was a poet and singer and founded a school of music that renewed and competed with the old conventional school of the Mausolees. From the early Abbasid period onward, one can speak of a fully developed courtly music in the Islamic empire. But even in Islamic times, the ancient Arabic or contemporary poem shaped the now refined music. Music was primarily song, poetry set to music, which is why it was designated rinne in contrast to music theory, which means musiki from the Greek her musike which was treated in the writings of the 3rd and 9th centuries, respectively. So the 3rd is the uh, Islamic century, and in the following I try only to uh, mention the, the Christian one, so that you, you don't uh, get confused, and me too. Um, so the, the writings of the 9th century, respectively, that have come down to us by the philosopher of the Arabs and polymath Al-Kindi. Uh, which lived in the ninth century to the eighth, the eighth century to the ninth century, and his uh, works were on harmony and rhythm. However, both terms are not always differentiated from each other, so rinne and musiki, but are occasionally used synonym synonymously. With the appointment of the newly established Baghdad as capital by Al-Mansur in 762, Basra emerged as another important center of musical education. 
the high esteem of knowledge gained through translations of ancient Greek texts on philosophy and science and the elaboration of indigenous systems such as grammar and law provided a fertile environment for the arts of poetry and music. Caliphs and princes organized musical sessions, majalis, at which musicians of the Basra school entertained participants with poetry and music. Famous were the two aforementioned Al-Mausilis, father and son, lived around, they lived around 800, and the father learning Persian singing in Rai Tabaristan. Their famous pupil Ziryab moved to Islamic Spain, Al-Andalus, and opened a music school that had a great influence on Spanish music, but also on troubadour music in France. This was also the time of the great divas at the courts. These single slaves, who usually also played an instrument, were very well trained because the better versed the musicians were in poetry, singing and playing instruments, the higher the price was they could be sold for on the slave market. Thus, merchants invested large sums of money, sent promising female slaves to be taught singing and instrumental skills and to expand their repertoire with famous singers, for example, the Mausilis, and also with female singers, but also trained them in the disciplines of the Arabic language, grammar, lexicography, moreover, in general education in the form of poetry, history, and biographical knowledge in addition to basic theological knowledge. It is known from the sources that among the famous female singer slaves, there were Byzantines whose singing was highly appreciated. Um, Ibn Fadl al Omari of the 14th century praises the Byzantine singing slave girl Futun al Adelia and says, she could play different instruments. In competitions, we would say poetry slams, she helped others so that everyone estimated her poems. She astonished her, uh, she astonished her audience greatly with her witty answers and her poetry. She was even depicted as shining example of her age. The poem that is cited here deals with wine and the invitation to enjoy the music because everything on earth is transit transitory. Why did these quick-witted and in some ways powerful single slaves exist for so many centuries in the courts of caliphs and princes? How could they write frivolous poetry and sing, even though the theologians railed against them? A plausible answer to this question seems to be Thomas Bauer's theory on the culture of ambiguity in Islam which can also explain how a culture as foreign as the Greek one could leave such an impact on the Arab Islamic science. Um, I talked about the context via the trade routes before, but I think that the Greek culture uh, was uh, perceived as foreign um, though. Against the background of a high tolerance for ambiguity in Islam, the diversity of sources and traditions can be understood as an enrichment of the views on events, persons, and texts. Thus, the use of poetry, for example, in a historical work is not contradictory to its historiographical claim. On the contrary, poetic components not only ensure a high degree of memorability, but also complement and broaden the perspective on the narrated event, thus contributing to a greater number of possible interpretations. This tolerance of interpretation meant that even an imam attending a more familiar evening session with a caliph could appreciate a linguistically sound poem with beautiful pictures and metaphors and its setting harmon harmonious in rhythm and melody, even if the content of the poem was religiously frowned upon. The setting, private versus public, also plays a role here. As a theologian, he argued differently about the subject matter than he did in the evening session as a confidant of the caliph. This tolerance of ambiguity apparently applied to non-Muslims as well, to Christian and Jewish musicians as long as they were versed. The history of the older of the al Mausilis with his Persian musical training also shows that transfer processes took place between different musical traditions and schools, between different cultures. This does not mean that minorities were not faced with problems. A certain Israel al Yahudi is described by Ibn Fadlallah al Omari as a successful and prolific musician. 
From the author's point of view, his religion was the only thing that prevented him from being the very best musician. From the perspective of his co-religionists, however, he betrayed his religion even though he studied the Psalms of David. At the same time, he tried to get rid of his dialect in Arabic. Thus, he stood, so to speak, between the cultures. The outlined tolerance of ambiguity in Islamic culture, as described by Bauer, could thus be one reason why ancient culture fell on such fertile Arab soil. In fact, the heyday of courtly musical culture coincided with a time when the translation movement from Greek had already emerged. For the first 100 years or so, the Arabs resorted to regional structures in the administration of their newly conquered territories. With the construction of the round city of Baghdad in 761, near the ancient Ktesiphon, the political and cultural center of gravity shifted eastward from Umayyad Damascus to the former Sassanid Empire, where Arabic language met Persian administration and court culture. This included Persian court astrologers, physicians, and surveyors employed at the Muslim Caliph's court. These, among others, were already translating scientific works from Persian and Indian into Arabic. In addition to these professions, the center of Christian Syriac scholarship in Haran, Baghdad, and Ktesiphon should be mentioned. By the councils of Ephesus in 431 and Chalcedon 451, Mea Physites had settled in Egypt and Greater Syria, and Nestorians had been displaced to the Sassanid Empire, where they proselytized along the Silk Road far to the east. The Aramaic-speaking Christian scholars took with them the knowledge of Greek antiquity from Alexandria and translated the text into Syriac um, Aramaic, as this language gradually supplanted the Greek. The ancient sciences described in the sources were characterized by accuracy of methods and data due to the unified worldview in which astronomy, the quadruplicity of humors, seasons, and elements, as well as mathematics were part of philosophy. The Muslim urban elite, princes, secretaries, and ministers, as well as those practicing professions such as astronomer, astronomers and physicians, saw the utility of ancient sciences for the long-term existence of Islam. Patrons from the administration, principality, and caliphate had libraries and monasteries searched for Greek sources and commissioned translations in the um, 8th to 10th centuries. Thus, tens of thousands of books were found in the libraries of Muslim courts including the famous Abbasid library Beit al-Hikmah, founded by Harun al-Rashid. As you can see here, the books are lying and not standing as nowadays. Therefore, the title was often written in the cut as well. This is an early um, yes, manuscript of the Syriac translation by Hunayn ibn Ishaq of Euclid's Elements, with a Greek text in the margin. Hunayn ibn Ishaq was a physician and philosopher, and together with the logician Matta ibn Yunus and the matician Thabit ibn Qurra, among the famous translators of the 9th century. Well-known translations include the medical compendium by Dioscurides de Materia Medica and Al-Jazari's Risala fil Handessa uh, in, of the 13th century, and the Institute of History of Arabic Islamic Sciences has reconstructed several of the machines of this and other books. Al Farabi wrote his book on music when the translation movement from Greek was long underway and the literature and music theory was flourishing. This was called musiki, as contrast to the practical music rinne, as we have already said. The well-known philosopher of the Arabs, Al-Kindi, who died after 870, wrote several treatises on this subject, 
but it was Al-Farabi, about 100 years later, he died 950, who made a special contribution to music theory with his truly great Kitab al-Musiqi al-Kabir. The edition we have is really heavy and has a, uh, more than 1,000 pages. Al-Farabi is widely known as a philosopher. Some of his writings, especially the enumeration of the sciences, Ihsa al-Ulum, but also works on logic, psychology, and Aristotelian physics were translated into Latin around the 12th century. So that Al-Farabi, or Avenassa, as he was also called in Latin, became a reference in European Latin thought of the time. Little known outside specialist circles is the fact that Al-Farabi entirely in the tradition of Greek scholars also made music the subject of his thought. As part of the mathematical sciences, music is closely related to arithmetic, just as astronomy relates to and is based on geometry. Music can therefore be thought of as applied arithmetic. Here you can see the six known manuscripts and the most important editions and translations. And here we come to the structure of the Kitab al-Musiqi al-Kabir. Al-Farabi wrote his great book on music according to its preface for al-Qarqi, the vizier of the Caliph al-Radi, to whom he wanted to explain the art of music. Such a dedication was typical when paying tribute to a patron. Al-Farabi's presumed patronage gave him the opportunity to define the science of music as part of his system of science to categorize it and to set forth all the aspects that he considered important and integral, integral to that science, namely the fundamentals of harmony, matters of rhythm and melodic composition. However, he emphasizes that he has added a separate uh, chapter on musical instruments of his time, which the ancient Green Greeks would not have done. Al-Kindi had already used Greek sources to some extent, but it was not until Al-Farabi's Al time that a larger number of Greek works in Arabic translation were available that dealt with music, such as works by Aristoxenos, Euclid, Nicomachus, and Ptolemy. As a philosopher, especially a commentator on Aristotle, and possible, uh, possibly a practicing musician, Al-Farabi was familiar with a variety of sources, he combined, adapted, and approved them. However, he not only collected sources on Greek music theory, but also drew on the Arab authors and musicians, Al-Kindi, Ishaq al-Mausili, and Ibn al-Munajim, whom he lists by name as sources, as well as his own observations of contemporary musical practice. Thus, Al-Farabi's dual approach of scholarly description and evaluation of Greek theories and reflections on musical practice makes his book um, a veritable treasure trove of Arabic music theory. In what follows, I highlight three distinct points of how Al-Farabi deals with his Greek sources, citations, calques, and the adoption or further development of concepts. Apart from Aristotle, Themistios, Ptolemy and Euclid, as well as the Pythagoreans, Al-Farabi does not mention his sources by name, and even these he mentions very rarely and not with every corresponding quotation. But here we have one of the literal quotations, namely by Themistios, in his paraphrase of Aristotle's Analytica Posteriora. Uh, then we also cite Themistios, who was known for his philosophical knowledge. He was one of the important followers of Aristotle and one of the leading authorities in the field. In one of his texts, he says, this was a quotation by Farabi, and now uh, the quotation by Themistios is coming. I know from my lessons with my teachers that the tone called pros lamba nominos, uh, al mafruda, is consonant to the one called messe al wusta but I'm not capable of perceiving their consonants because I have only little training in it. Oh. However, this seems to be a translation or transmission error because Al-Farabi speaks of an octave, here the proslama nominus to the messe, um, 
whereas Themistio speaks of a fourth, hypate to meze. Perhaps Al-Farabi or a translator or a copyist intentionally changed the text because he thought Themistius could hear a fourth uh, and it is quite more difficult to hear the difference between an octave than that of a fourth when playing the marginal notes at the same time. Um, these are some examples for calques and we see uh, from the first Example mod for modulation, the word for mod modulation is in Arabic intiqal, which means to be moved, and in Greek it's metabole, to be thrown. That's not a real uh, translation, but it's similar. But if we have a look at the words for high pitch and low pitch, then we, can, we come quite near. Uh, hidda and sikal are the nouns, and in the Greek we have the um, adjectives, hedda for sharpness and oxus for sharp, sikal for heaviness uh, and barus for heavy. Then the musical function is translated uh, in Arabic by the word of kuwa, and this translates the Greek dunamis, and both have the meaning of power and strength. And uh, the, the last two examples for the intervals of a fourth and an octave, Alezi bil arba, that with or by the four, and alezi bil kul, that with or by the whole, um, is a, word, a, a literal translation of the Greek, um, yeah, of the Greek uh, dia tesaron and dia pason. And this is uh, very interesting because the correct expression in Arabic is dhul arba and dhul kul. Um, the normal way to refer to possessions is uh, to say um, the, uh, the owner of the four and the owner of the whole. This would be a typical Arabic um, term for translating dia tesaron and dia pason, but uh, here the tr literal translation is used. Um, what might be of interest is the word kua, literally power, strange, a translation of the Greek dynamis in philosophy, usually translated as potency. Uh, these are two paragraphs of the great book on music in the chapter on wind instruments, Mazamir. Their gamut are described in terms of tones on the lute. On this picture, you can see the names of the fingers at the top. Uh, little finger. I don't know, do you see my um, my mouse? Oh, you can see the um, at the top, the fingers and uh, the names of the four strings on the right. Uh, the bum is the lowest string and the intervals between the open strings are fourths. Tone B is the open string in the text and tone H, uh, the index finger. I quote Al-Farabi, on this mismar, there is an octave between the tones B and H. If we identify the tamdid of tone B with the tamdid of the open methleth string, or if we identify it bil kua with the tone of the open methleth string, tone H will be the tone of the index finger on the zir string. And the other uh, example, if we identify, this is uh, marked as the black points here in the drawing. And now um, come the, the orange points. If we identify other spots, if we identify tone B with the tone of the open bum string, tone H will be the tone of the index finger on the mathna string. And in general, if we identify tone B with any tone on any instrument, either by identifying it with a tamdid or bilkua, tone H will be the upper octave of that tone on that instrument. Obviously, the difference between tones on the lute and musical function is pointed out here. In a philosophical context, one translates kua as potency, but here musical function fits better since the interval is thought of without regard to the used instrument. That leads us to another concept, namely that of tamdid. From what we have just read, one might conclude that tamdid means the position of the fingers on the fingerboard. But is this correct? Is it? 
Thesis, the position, or Tazis, the pitch. Al-Farabi says, the state of any tone in any transposed system, be it low or high in pitch, I mean its state in any low or high pitch is called Tamdid. So this is another um, paragraph uh, in, in, the, in another chapter in um, Al-Farabi's Kitab al-Musiqi al-Kabir, uh, which explains what is the meaning of Tamdid and gives a um, definition of it. This is the third example of how Al-Farabi deals with Greek concepts. Um, and it can be seen in the chapter on tetrachords from the book on the elements of music. In it, Al-Farabi writes about the tonal relationships within a tetrachord. Tetrachords are components of tonal scales, two of them plus one tone forming what is called a group, jama'a, Greek systema, or a musical system, simply. As is well known, a tetrachord uh, consists of four tones, and they are named with the letters of the abjad alphabet here. Abjad is the old um, Ar Arabic alphabet with three intervals. And these intervals can be given as a ratio when a string is divided. I would like to present you an example of what Al-Farabi calls a soft jins, which means one of the three intervals is larger than the other two combined. This is known in Greek music theory as pyknon, dense. In Greek music theory, these are the enharmonic and chromatic tetrachords. So first, Al-Farabi categorizes the tetrachords and then lists all the compositions of tetrachords. Thus, for each interval, he relates the length of the fretted strings. As an example, you see the regular non-consecutive soft tetrachord here. This is how um, Farabi calls it. Since the fourth is in the ratio four to three, the, uh, Al-Farabi takes the next smaller interval for each tetrachord, those shown in the first column, five to four, six to five, and seven to six. So the first column from up downwards, yes. The interval remaining when subtracted, subtracted from the fourth for four to three minus five to four is 16 to 15. Uh, so this is then divided by approximately two, adhering at least to a large extent to the principle of epimoric uh, ratios. Where did Al-Farabi get his numerical ratios? Although he does not give his source for the chapter, Ptolemy is obviously the source. In the last column, you can see the passage in Ptolemy's harmonics of book two, um, chapter 13. Other theorists, namely Didymos and Eratosthenes, quoted by Ptolemy, had already mentioned two of these three types, but the last one was added by Al-Farabi himself. So the third tense, the last line in this table. And in the chapter on musical instruments, we see why. Referring to the regular non-consecutive soft gins, Al-Farabi shows how to play all three kinds of it on the tumbur bardadi, a long-necked lute. So he needs this last tetrachord, not only because this is the logical continuation of the previous tetrachord divisions, but also because this tetrachord was obviously played on this long-necked lute. We have here then an example of how a system was adopted at the same time as it was uh, further thought out and adapted to cultural characteristics. In this context, Al-Farabi does not matter about the fact that Ptolemy quotes Didymos and Eratosthenes in order to criticize them. He's using an ancient theory to theorize what he hears in his culture. Thus, we have a good example of transfer, but also of the creation of something new from two musical cultures, Ptolemy's tetrachord theory and the Arabic rina. Al-Farabi's Kitab al-Musiqi al-Kabir was not known in the Latin Middle Ages, as far as we know. All that was known of his musical writings was a little chapter of the Ihsa al-Ulum, 
the enumeration of the sciences in Latin de scientis. And this was translated by um, two times, twice, translated by Gerhard of uh, Cremona and Dominicus Gundisalvi. However, his influence in Arabic music theory was enormous. He found well-known successes of mathematical music theory in Ibn Sina of the um, died 1037 and Omar Khayyam uh, died in the 12th century, both of whom added to and commented on Al-Farabi's tetrachords or in the case of uh, Khayyam, Ibn Sina's tetrachords as well. The last of the great authors of Abbasid music theory, Safi ad din al-Urmawi, who died in the, at the end of the 13th century, systematized music theory and, with a 17-tone system, coined the Maqam system, to which both Ottoman Turkish and contemporary classical Arabic music refer. This musical system has long been adapted and is perceived in the Islamic world as something of its own, albeit in its respective regional manifestations. The history of the Islamic world is characterized by exchange between cultures in the fields of philosophy, the sciences as theoretical philosophy and later detached from it, and of course culture in the narrower sense of music, art and literature, and all this until today. Here I have listed my, or parts of my uh, used literature. And I thank you for your attention. Shukran jazilan li hosni estime aikum. Yes, I mean, thank you so very much indeed. That was a fascinating tour through the transformation and transferal of knowledge from one culture to the next. Um, vastly fascinating. Yeah, let me just start with some very basic and, and minor minor questions. Um, so did I understand correctly that Al-Farabi himself did not read Greek? So he was dependent on Greek, on translations from the Greek, is that correct? Yeah, we don't have any information about this on this, and uh, it's always a question that uh, arises, of course. Uh, as far as I know, he did not speak and read, or at least he did not translate Greek texts into Arabic. Um, but I don't know if one can use the Greek uh, like he did without knowing any Greek. Also, mm -hmm. But I could imagine that he knows, uh, that he knew one or the other word or expression or maybe more, but uh, we don't know uh, about any translation he had made himself. So I think he was dependent on translations. And um, as we know from Honain um, ibn Ishaq, because he has written about the translation process. He was one of these famous um, translators that uh, his translations, at least, and the ones of the mentioned uh, contemporaries of him were really, uh, really precise and really elaborate. So maybe Al-Farabi could write all those wonderful things without knowing any Greek word because of these great translations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mm, interesting. Thank you. Um, maybe one last from my side was the transferal of musical knowledge and um, concepts ever frowned upon. Was it ever discussed? Was it a matter of concern? Or was it something that was taken as a very natural flow between the cultures and the religions? Um, yeah, I just wonder if it was um, if, if it was at any point disputed. Yes, disputed. Um, first of all, it, music was part of the mathematical science, and as such, the mathematical science were of interest to the um, to the Arabs because they needed them for astronomical reasons, for uh, surveillance of uh, country sites. 
uh, agriculture. So uh, they they really needed all those knowledge knowledges, and uh, music was part of this. So they just uh, learned and studied it because they thought it was a kind of um, knowledge that that need to be learned together. That's perhaps uh, as one reason for music. And the other one is, um, for example, the Arabic language was held in high esteem because the, the language of the Holy Quran is Arabic. So they were not interested in Greek tragedies, of course. They haven't translated any Greek tragedy or any other part of uh, literature, Greek literature. They were interested in useful um, literature on sciences because they needed to know the direction of Mecca, how to read the stars, how to, um, to deal with agri agriculture. For example, um, the water flows for agricultural reasons or ge geography. And uh, of course, there were the, the big disputes between theology and philosophy, the, the Greek philosophy and uh, the, the Muslim theology, uh, especially in metaphysics, metaphysical um, questions. Is there God? Uh, how can we um, decide if he or she is there? And uh, is there any... Um, Anything that is that makes the uh, makes it evident that there must be God. All those questions were disputed dipu disputed uh, very much. Um, but also the question um, of grammar versus uh, logics, for example. This was also uh, one of the questions disputed. Okay. Well, Yasmin, thank you so much. Um, there are just always, you always meet people you just want to sit together and study from and learn from. So um, I'm, I'm, I thank you greatly for just opening up this fantastic uh, world to us of this transfer of knowledge, translation of knowledge. Um, Thank you very much indeed for, for joining you. today and for presenting. Um, and to everyone here in the forum, there will be no lecture um, in May, but please do come again and join us in June. On the 15th of June, we're going to hear Professor Matthew Milliner um, on the Tao of Mary, images of the Virgin in the Church of the East. So for those interested in these um, literary um, tra um, traditions and iconography, please join us. And I'm going to put the, um, the link to our next um, event in the chat again. So please come and join us uh, at one of our next events. Thank you again, Yasmin. Thank you for organizing the internet uh, events and everything surrounding the Oxford Interfaith Forum. Um, it's a great labor of love and um, it uh, is very much appreciated by all those who have the chance to come to these events. So everybody join us again and thank you for coming tonight and good night to you all. Thank you so much. Bye.